Hello everyone. Today's video is about analog to digital converter and we're going to emphasize the sampling theorem. Let's assume you have this continuous signal x of t and we need to convert it to a digital signal. So the first step is sampling, then quantization, then binary representation or coding. So let's look at each one of them. So sampling, you have to decide how many samples per second you will be taking. So maybe a thousand samples per second, and we will learn what determine the number of samples per second. But that's what you do. You take a sample here, and you take a sample after you de decide the sampling rate. This is the sampling interval, and we call it TS. Now, after you finish sample the signal, now you have discrete values. You have this discrete value here, you have this discrete value here, and there are unlimited possibility of values. So just if this is zero and this is 10 volt, let's assume, then from zero to 10 volt, you may have a million possible value for the samples. You may have 3.0013.1002 .0 and so forth. So every sample then will need large number of bits to represent. Bits, I mean 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 digital binary bits. So then what's the solution? The solution is quantization. That means I will just set specific values here. Maybe 1 volt, 2 volt, and so forth. 3, 4, up to 10. Any sample between these two levels will be quantized to specific value. So it will be rounded up either or rounded down. And that's what we mean by quantization. After you do the quantization, now every amplitude of a sample will be represented by binary 011101. So this is today's lecture. We're going to go through these three concepts. So let's visualize what is sampling and what is the consequence of sampling. Let's start with, we have a signal in the time domain. It's a continuous. This signal is sinc square t. Now, if I want to know what is the spectrum, the Fourier transform of this continuous, it's this one. This is x of omega. And you can use the table and you will find the Fourier transform of a sinc square is a triangle. Now, if I look at the Fourier transform here, the bandwidth from 0 to 10 pi, so that is the bandwidth, that's the highest frequency in this signal, is 10 pi radians per second. Or if I divide by 2 pi, it will be 5 hertz. So let's assume we sample this continuous signal by taking 10 samples per second. So then I multiply this continuous signal by this train of impulses. And if I take 10 samples per second, that means the time interval between adjacent impulse is 1 over 10, that's 0.1 second. So when you multiply this train of impulses by this continuous signal, x of t, that's the sample you are getting. So you are getting a sample at 0, at 0.1, at 0.2, and so forth. So now x bar t, this is the sample continuous signal. So let's find out what's the spectrum, what's the Fourier transform of this sample signal. Well, let's go back first to this train of impulses in the time domain and find out what's the Fourier transform of this train of impulses. Well, this is a periodic signal and we found in chapter seven, the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of this periodic signal, or similarly the Fourier series, is another train of impulses. But now we are in the frequency domain. The amplitude of each impulse is 2 pi over Ts, and you will have an impulse at 0, an impulse at omega s, where omega s is just 2 pi over Ts. And these we use to call it in the Fourier series. This is we call the first harmonic, the second harmonic, the third, and so forth. So there is a relationship between the sampling interval, Ts, 0.1 second for this example, and the sampling rate, f of s, which is omega s, is 1 over 0.1, 10 samples. Okay, so when we did multiplication in the time domain of the x of t and this train of impulses, we got this signal. 
Now from the Fourier transform property, we found out that multiplication in the time domain is equivalent to convolution in the frequency domain. So now you are convolving this x of omega with this signal. And we find out that when you convolve any signal with an impulse, you get the signal back at the location of the impulse. And we found that when we did time analysis. This can apply also in the frequency domain. So now I am convolving these signal with this impulse. So what am I going to get? I will get the signal again at the location of the impulse. Convolve this with this impulse. I will get the signal again at the location of this impulse and so forth. So the Fourier transform of this discrete signal is this one. So in the time domain multiplication, give me this in the frequency domain, it's convolution of these two signal and I got this signal. Now, if I take more samples instead of only at 0.1 second, I take at 0.05 second. So this is the signal if I take more samples. So now my sampling rate Ts is smaller, 0 0.05. So my f of s will be 20 samples per second. So now this replica will be centered around 20 hertz 20 times 2 pi you get 40 so now they are separated and there is a big advantage the big advantage when i try to reconstruct the signal the original signal from these samples all i have to do is take these samples to a low pass filter that looks like this so it will eliminate these and eliminate these and just give me back the original signal which is this one that's the advantage of oversampling, sampling at a higher rate. Yes, we will have now more samples to process, to store, to transmit, but we can create practical filter to reconstruct the original signal from the samples. And we will see all the math behind that. But in this case, to get this spectrum, which is the original spectrum of the continuous signal, you need to have an ideal filter, low pass filter that will allow only these and eliminate all this spectrum. So if I take these samples to an ideal low pass filter, I will get these back again, continuous signal. This is just to help you visualize it, but we will see the math behind it. So the sampling theorem says the following, a real signal whose spectrum is band limited to B Hertz. So the highest frequency is B Hertz can be reconstructed exactly from its samples taking uniformly at a rate, sampling rate f of s, equal or larger than 2b. When you sample at exactly twice the bandwidth, when f s equal 2b, then we call this f s the Nyquist rate. So you are sampling at the Nyquist rate. That's the minimum sampling rate you can use so you can reconstruct the continuous signal exactly from its samples without any loss. Just imagine with these samples, you can figure out the value of all these points exactly without any error, as long as you are sampling at the Nyquist rate or higher. So we showed this in the previous slide to visualize. So let's see the math. So when I take this signal, the continuous signal x of t, which is this here, and I multiply it by this train of impulses, I get this signal. So the train of impulses representation of is this one. And when we studied the Fourier series, we said this is a periodic signal we can represent it in an exponential Fourier series representation and it will be 1 over t, we found dn is 1 over t, ej n omega s, where n omega s are the harmonics. So this expression is exactly the same. Instead of representing the train of impulses this way, now I represent it in the exponential Fourier series. So this mathematical expression is the representation of these impulses of different amplitude. Now, if I want to find this spectrum, all I have to do is take the Fourier transform of this. So when we take the Fourier transform, we get this one. When we take the Fourier transform of this one, now we're going to go back to the Fourier transform property, the frequency shift. So you multiply x of t 
by ej and omega s in the time domain in the frequency domain you are shifting the spectrum of this signal x of omega to be centered around n omega s so the fourier transform of x of t time ej and omega st is same spectrum of the original signal but centered around minus n omega s and this expression here describe this spectrum if the sampling rate is high or this spectrum so when n is zero you get x of omega that will be this when n is one you get x of omega centered around omega s which is this one and that is omega s when n is two that's two omega s you get this one centered around two omega s and omega s we found it 25 from the previous slide and that's the sampling theorem why you need the sampling rate to be twice the bandwidth so the bandwidth is 10 the sampling rate is 20 pi so this rep this spectrum will not overlap with this if this was not 20 pi if the sampling rate was less than twice the bandwidth so the bandwidth is 10 pi if it was less than 20 pi this here will be shifted this way and then there will be overlap and we will see the consequence of overlapping and when there is overlap you will not be able to get this back again the original spectrum that's why your sampling rate has to be twice the bandwidth so you keep this replica away from each other not overlapping and that's why they usually when they sample in practice they sample higher than the sampling rate to keep them even even further away from each other so then you can use a regular practical second third order low pass filter to allow this to pass and this will be eliminated so you process the signal in the discrete time domain or in the digital signal processing or transmitted the samples and now the receiver want to reconstruct the original signal from these samples how will they do it we already said we pass it through a low pass filter and that will pass only so we get back here let's see the math how do we explain it first let's visualize before we start the math so we said we have these samples and the Fourier transform of these samples is this one so in the time domain to reconstruct the original signal back again we said in the frequency domain we take it through a, a low pass filter so that means you take these samples which is here through a low pass filter and the output of the low pass filter you will get the continuous signal perfectly with no error in the frequency domain it's easy to see the Fourier transform of the discrete signal is this one you take it through a low pass filter you get back this spectrum which is the original spectrum of the continuous signal let's see how to visualize it in the time domain and before we do that let's look at the low pass filter here the frequency response of a low pass filter is this one any frequency between 0 and 2 pi b will pass anything above 2 pi b will be eliminated so if the bandwidth is 5 b is 5 that's mean 2 pi times 5 is 10 so this low pass filter will allow only these to pass up to 10 pi in the time the inverse laplace transform of a pulse we found it to be a sync function and we call this the impulse response h of t of the low pass filter that means if you excite this low pass filter by an impulse that's the output you will get a sync function so now the input to this low pass filter is many many impulses of different amplitude when this impulse hits this low pass filter you will get a sync function at this location so that will be the blue one then when this impulse hit the low pass filter you get a sync function which is this black line sync function when this impulse hit you will get this red sync function if you add all these sync function you will get perfectly this signal which is a continuous signal and that's how we reconstruct the signal in the frequency domain i said it's easy to visualize you take this spectrum of the sample signal through a low pass filter you get this out which is the spectrum of the original continuous signal 
In the time domain, you take these samples through a low pass filter. At every location of an impulse, you get a sync functions. One, two, three. If you add them up, that's what you get. Now let's see the math that will prove that. In the frequency domain, we said we take the spectrum of the discrete signal, which is this one and this one and this one, to a low pass filter that has frequency response h of omega, and that's h of omega. So when I multiply these by the whole thing here, what I will get out of this low pass filter, only this I will get out. That's in the frequency domain. That's what it means, the math. In the time domain, it says, if you take this discrete signal, which is mathematically represented by an impulses at different location, n t, t is the sampling interval. So when n is zero, that's an impulse, which is this one of amplitude, the value of the function at t equals zero. And when n is one, you get this impulse, which is this. And the amplitude will be the value of the function at this location. Now, if this signal go to a low pass filter, so this signal input go to a low pass filter, the output will be the convolution of the input with the impulse response of the system. And we learned that the convolution of any signal with an impulse you get the signal back at the location of the impulse. This is just a number. So the convolution of h of t with this impulse, t is a variable, you will get this impulse at this location, n of t. So you will get h of t minus n of t. So you will get this at the location of the impulse. And we said for an ideal low pass filter, the impulse response is a sync function. So replace this h by this sync function. And the original signal is reconstructed by a sync function at different locations, at this location, or the red one, or the blue one, with amplitude x of n. This is the amplitude of the signal, original signal at t0, at t here, t is sampling interval 2, 3, and so forth. So when you add all these sync function with different amplitude, all these sync function and these and these, you will get exactly the signal x of t. Let's take this example. Here they said determine the Nyquist sampling rate of the signal. So now you have to look at the highest frequency or the bandwidth. Well, when we look here, the highest frequency is omega this one. So that's 30 pi. That's like omega. So 2 pi f is 30 pi. So f is 15, and you can call also this is the bandwidth, 15. So Nyquist rate has to be twice the bandwidth. So then the Nyquist sampling rate will be 2b, that is 2 times 15, that is 30 samples per second. Okay, so what happened if you undersample? So you sample lower than the Nyquist sampling rate. For example, let's assume we have this continuous signal and this is the spectrum. So the bandwidth B, it could be 1200 Hertz. If we follow the Nyquist rate, then I should sample this signal at 2400, twice the bandwidth. But instead, I sampled that at 2000 sample per second. So that means the sampling interval is 0.5 millisecond. So I took samples like this. The sampling interval is half millisecond. Now the spectral of these samples will look like this one. I expand it. So it will be the same as the original spectrum repeated every f of s, every 2000. So this is the first one here. The second one centered around fs 2000. So that is here and have the sampling rate f of s is here 1000. And the same thing here. So now we have overlap. So this spectrum is not totally separated. And higher frequency, like let's say 1100, somewhere here, this frequency here, will be aliased as 900. So that frequency here, now aliased as this frequency. So the 1100 will be aliased 
as 900. Now, since you sampled at 2,000 samples per second, you are assuming your highest frequency is 1,000. So you're going to use filter to reconstruct this original signal from its samples with a cutoff frequency half the sampling rate. So that's 1,000 hertz. So low pass filter going to look something like this. A cutoff frequency of fs over 2 that's a thousand hertz and the spectrum that will come outside the low pass filter will look something like this this is a thousand this here 800 hertz and that flat thing here is because you are adding this sample with this sample this value with this value this value with this value so when you add those you get flat that's the flat thing here so now this is not exactly the same spectrum of the original signal so the signal you will be getting will be somehow distorted something like this maybe instead of having this smooth and what is aliasing so any frequency above a thousand which is fs over two will be alias so this one is 1100 100 hertz above fs over 2 above the 1000 so it will be alias as 1000 minus 100 that's 900 if you have this frequency which is 1150 it's 150 above half the sampling rate which is you assume the bandwidth of the signal 1000 so 150 above the 1000 so this frequency here will be alias here as 850 hertz and this is the price for sampling under the Nyquist rate or under sampling so always sample at the Nyquist rate or above the Nyquist rate and in this slide it's the same thing what we did you have the original signal here this is the spectrum you under sample it now the spectrum will be overlapping if you use a low pass filter with fs over 2 that's the low pass filter that's the signal that will come out and that is the reconstructed signal from these samples so when you under sample all frequency in the original signal that are above or higher than the sampling rate divided by 2 will be alias as lower frequency and this equation will tell you each frequency above half the sampling rate will be alias or will appear as a lower frequency. FA is the apparent frequency. So in our example, we said if you sampled at 2000 sample per second, you are assuming the maximum frequency 1000. So now you have this 1100. How is it going to appear? It's above 1000. So you plug here 1100. Here, plug for M1. M can be 1, 2, 3 because you may have really high, high frequency. So you start with M1. So then M times 2000 is 2000. So 1100 minus 2000 minus 900. You get the magnitude, that's 900. So the 1100 will appear as 900. Same thing we showed in the previous slide. Let's take another example. If you have 3200 in your original signal, then if you use this equation, it will be 3200 minus f of s is 2000 what you will get in this case 1200 1200 is more than a thousand so it doesn't meet that condition so then i have to increase my m by two try two so now two times two thousand is four thousand so now three thousand two hundred minus four thousand is minus eight hundred the absolute value is eight hundred so now that meets the condition eight hundred is less than a thousand so the 3200 will be alias and appear as 800 hertz if you cannot increase the sampling rate and you only can sample at 2000 because of the equipment you have then what you do you take the original signal first to a low pass filter that will eliminate all these high frequencies so it will allow only a thousand to pass anything above a thousand will filter it out from the original signal then you start sampling at 2000 so now your signal will appear like this and this will not be present and it's still much better the distortion probably gonna be something like this and to help you visualize aliasing imagine the following you have a sinusoidal signal with 
11 hertz frequency. You should sample it at least 22 samples per second, but instead you sampled it at 10 hertz. So let's see what happened. So our original signal is a sinusoidal 11 hertz, and you took these samples. If I draw the spectrum of the original signal, it is this one. There is 11 hertz and minus 11. If I draw the spectrum of the sampled signal, you basically repeat this spectrum around the sampling frequency, 10. So this will be centered around 10. So that's the zero will be here, 10. The 11 plus 10, 21. Minus 11 plus 10, you get the minus one. So this will be the blue arrow here, and again centered around minus 10. So this would be minus 11, minus 10, minus 21. This is 11, minus 10 is one. This is the red. And again, around minus 20 and so forth. Since you sampled at 10, you are assuming your highest frequency is five hertz have the sampling rate. So you're gonna take these samples through a low pass filter with cutoff frequency five hertz to reconstruct the signal. But guess what? What's coming out of this low pass filter, only these one hertz and the minus one hertz. So the signal you are reconstructing from these samples is not these 11 hertz. It's a sinusoidal with frequency one hertz. And to help you see it, that's the signal you will be getting, a one hertz. See how all the sample fit perfectly on this one hertz because you undersample. If you sample at least at 22 hertz, you will have enough sample that show this point, which is not in the one hertz, this point, which is not here, and this point, which is not here. And if you plug, what is the apparent frequency in this equation? Plug for 11, F, the frequency is 11, F of S is 10, 11 minus 10, let M1, 11 minus 10 is one, and that's the one. Okay, so we are done with sampling. Now let's move on after you sample to quantization and binary representation of the samples. So you have this signal X of T continuous, and we decide to sample it at 10 samples per second. So this is the sample we will be getting, this sample and this and this and this and so forth. Now, if I want to transmit these samples as binary, that value, the amplitude here, and here, even if this signal is like from minus four volt to plus four volt, each sample here has infinite possibility of values. That could be 3.85790. This could be 3.912450 and so forth. So then for each sample to represent it by binaries like zeros, one, one, zero, you will need a large binary numbers for each sample if you want to represent it exactly. And that's a lot of data. So we do quantization. So what is quantization? The first step is you decide how many level do you want? Let's assume this signal, it goes from minus four volt to four volt. How many level do you want to divide this range from minus four to four? That's what we call L, number of level. And that will determine the quantization error. So let's assume in this problem, I decide to eight level. So that's one level, two level, three, four, five, six, seven, eight level. If I need to represent each level by a binary number, since I have eight level, all I need is two to the power of n should be eight. That means in this case, n is three, because two to the power of three is eight. So I can represent these eight levels in the middle of each division, these eight levels by three binary. Each number will be represented by three binaries. So before we do that, we have to quantize this amplitude. Any amplitude here, I will make it in the middle. So any amplitude fall in this range, I will give it the middle value. And these samples now will be quantized as follow. See this one here? I will approximate it up to 3.5. So that's 3.5. These, I will approximate it 2.5. That's 2.5. So any sample fall between these levels will be quantized at the middle, 3.5. Here it will be 2.5, 1.5, half. And these are quantized samples. So any sample will have these possible values, 3.5, 2.5, 1.5, 
half and so forth. Now because of the quantization, there is a quantization error. Look at this one. That probably was 3.9. Now it's 3.5. So that's a quantization error of 0.4. Or it could be 4. And I quantize it down to 3.5. So that's a quantization error of half volt. And that's the constraint. Before you decide how many level, yes, the less level you set, the less binary numbers you will need for each sample. But the quantization error will be larger. So how do we define the quantization error? It's delta x over 2. So if I define this width to be delta x, then the maximum quantization error will be delta x divided by 2. That means this sample was right here. And they sample it down by half level, by delta x over 2. So that's the maximum quantization error. How do we find delta x here? Well, delta x will equal the range of value for the samples, in this case, x max for volt minus x min, minus 4. So that's 8, divided by the number of levels. So it is always delta x, this, equal the maximum possible positive value of the signal minus the maximum negative value of the signal divided by the number of levels you set. Usually, we assume x min, the absolute value of x min, equal x max. So we just say 2 times the maximum value divided by L. That would be delta x. And the maximum quantization error will be delta x divided by 2. And all samples here will have only this possible value. Some coding will choose the, those level values, but in this example, we chose the middle. 3.5, 2.5, 1.5, half, minus half, and so forth. The fourth step is now how do we convert these to binaries? Again, there is many, many coding, binary coding, but in this example, we chose zero represent negative, the maximum bit is negative, one represent positive, the lowest one is zero, so that's zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, and so forth. So after we quantize, we see the sample, which value it's closer to this one, and that's the binary bit that we transmit. And when we transmit these binary bits, 101, actually we transmit them as pulses modulated by high sinusoidal signal. It could be as high as gigahertz. And we already learned how we do modulation. Okay. Let's take this example. We have a five minute segment of music sampled at 44,100 sample per second. The amplitudes of the samples are quantized to 1,024 levels. Determine the size of the segment in bits. So to store these five minutes music, how many bits we're gonna be storing? So the first step is we need to find how many samples. So we have, this is the music, and it's going for five minutes. And we are taking samples. And we need to know how many samples. So number of samples in five minutes equal five minutes. There are 60 seconds in each minute. And we are taking 44,100 samples each second. So the total number of samples we will be taking in the five minutes is 13,230,000 samples in five minutes. Now the question is they want to know how many bits. The number of level is 1,024. So L equal 1,024. So for every sample you will use N bits. So we have to solve these equations. L equal 2N. And this will be 1024 equal to n. And here n equal log 1024 divided by log 2. And you will get 10 bits per sample. So number of bits for the 5 minutes equal 13,230,000 sample time 10 bits per sample. So that will give you 132,300,000 bits in five minutes. That's a lot of bits. But in real life, they use a lot of compression to store uh, music. Okay, let us look at this example. Now, five telemetry signals, this is like in the medical field and hospital. 
five telemetry signals, each of bandwidth one kilohertz. So let's draw the five telemetry. So you can think of this telemetry is like a monitor for every patient and they are wired to the nurse station and in for one nurse she can see the screen of five patients. Now they said five telemetry signal, each of bandwidth one kilohertz are quantized and binary coded. These signals are time division multiplexed. So then the piece of wire comes from here. We have here a multiplexer and it has one, two, three, four, five. And this is a clock. And this a piece of wire goes here to each station. And then this piece of wire go to the big monitor for the nurse. Each station has maybe a heart rate or temperature measurement or oxygen level in the blood. So there is a signal and the bandwidth is one kilohertz okay and this is another signal here and so forth multiplexing mean it take a sample from here a sample from here a sample from here a sample from this station and so forth and then it transmitted this way s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 to the nurse computer then it go back again this go back again and pick up s1 s2 and s3 so this clock just keep rotating and pick up. It's a digital uh, clock, it's a switch, not really a mechanical clock. Now they said here, choose the number of quantization level so that the maximum error in the peak signal amplitude is no greater than 0.2% of the peak signal amplitude. So if I take any one of these stations and now let's assume the signal comes like this, and so forth and then I divide these two levels they give me the criteria the quantization error this is delta x and the quantization error is half delta x so the maximum quantization error they said quantization error max equal 0.2 percent that's mean 0.2 divided by 100 of the peak signal amplitude so let's say this is the peak here x max of x max so they want us to choose the level such that the quantization error will not be greater than this. Well, we know quantization error equal delta x over 2. This is delta x here. This is the level width, and it's half of it. And also, we know delta x equal, if this is x max and this is x max, so the range here will be 2x max divided by the number of level, give us delta x. So I have these three pieces of information, one, two, three. I can solve it to find L, quantization error equal delta X over two. So I plug for delta X this value. So delta X over two will equal two X max divided by L divided by two. And that is X max divided by L. That's the maximum quantization error. And they gave me the criteria for the maximum quantization error is this. So this has to equal or less than. So now I can solve this to find L, the number of level I need here. So if I solve this, X max here will cancel. To solve this, let's do cross product here. Multiply this by L. So I get 0.2 to L larger than 100 and L will be 100 divided by 0.2 that's 500 level that's how much levels I need at least 500 or more okay so we solve that they said the signal must be then here they said the signal must be sampled at least 20% above the Nyquist rate okay so f of s has to be 20% above, so that's 1.2 time the Nyquist rate is 2 times the bandwidth. So that's 1.2 time 2 times 1,000 is 2,000. And that's 2,400 sample per second. Determine the data rate, bits per second, of the multiplex signal. So they want to know how many bits per second. Well, if I find how many bits per second for each channel or telemetry, then I just multiply by 5. I need to find the number of bits to represent this 500 level. So that's first. Well, I solve this equation. L equal 2 to the power of n. This is 500 equal to n 
And if you solve this equation, you will find n equal 8.9 per sample. But as we said, n cannot be fraction. It has to be integer. So then these should go to n equal 9 bits per sample. So for each channel, I need to transmit 2,400 sample per second. Each sample is 9 bit. So for each channel, I need to transmit 2,400 samples per second. And for each sample is 9 bits. So when I multiply these, I should get 21,600 bits per second. That's how many bits for each channel. For the whole system, I just multiply by 5. And if I multiply these, and that's the solution. To summarize everything, the signal you will be measuring from real life, most of the time it's an analog signal. So you will have sensors. It could be temperature sensors, voltage, uh, light sensors. That will pick up the parameter you are trying to measure. It will be analog signal. First step, you do pre-filter to enhance, get rid of noise, cut off high frequency you don't want to sample. Then you do the ideal analog to digital converter. And that is sampling, quantization, coding, and that's this one. Then you do all the discrete time system processing or digital signal processing. And then you will get out, after you do the processing, you get the signal. It's still in discrete form. Then you do the ideal digital to analog converter. You convert back this to an analog signal that we can understand, hear, or see. And the ideal digital to analog converter is just you take this to a low pass filter and reconstruct the continuous signal from the discrete values. Well, that concludes the sampling, quantization, and coding concept of signal processing. Thank you.